We're back uh, with Dr. Uh, Craig Keener, uh, and we're about to enter into uh, the book of the Revelation. So without any further ado, uh, let me offer a prayer, and then, then we'll have Dr. Keener come back. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this time now. We pray that, again that you would open our mind and our hearts, Father, to hear your voice and understand the meaning of your word, Father, and to delve deeper into these things, Father, during this time. I bless Dr. Keener now. Anoint him and use him for your glory and for our good. We pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Yeah. I, I did want to, uh, based on one of the questions that was asked earlier, I thought of this during the, the break, that another example, of course, there could be other examples besides this, but another example would be when Yeshua healed a leper and told him to go show himself to the priest and offer the sacrifice that Moses commanded. So Yeshua, um, I heard something last night where somebody said, you know, he thought, oh, I thought, I thought Jesus was Catholic, you know. Uh, no, uh, there are a lot of misunderstandings. I remember one time I was in Brighton Beach and I was, I was speaking with a Russian Jewish man and he said, uh, uh, you know, you Gentiles, you think Jesus was, uh, you, you don't know Jesus was Jewish. I said, no, no, I know Jesus was Jewish. He said, well, Stalin, man, I'm going to talk with you. I mean, there's so many things that we don't, um, so many, I mean, we may not come to consensus and everything, but there's so many things where if we would actually sit down and talk, we could clear up so many misconceptions. But in any case, coming to the book of Revelation. Now, Revelation has more, it doesn't have quotations from the Old, the Old Testament so much, but it's it's fuller of, of allusions to the Tanakh than any other book in the Berit HaDashah. I mean, it's just seething with these. And its literary form seems to be a combination between um, the kind of prophecy you have in the Tanakh and also um, what's called apocalyptic literature. So you know, a couple centuries earlier, you have First Enoch, or at least most of First Enoch. You have some uh, stuff like this in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which includes parts of First Enoch, and you know, four of the five major parts of First Enoch. So, it was a very Jewish literary form. It's not as familiar today, but um, it it would be very intelligible to Jewish audiences in the first century. So, I'm going to skip a lot here and there because covering the whole book, I mean, again, I have a 40 hour doctoral level course in Revelation. So this is just samples, but um, the epistolary introduction tells us about the God who sends the revelation that no matter what we're facing and some of the congregations who were being addressed were facing persecution. Some of them even to the point of potentially dying for their faith. And others were just kind of assimilating into the world system around them that was uh, killing their brothers and sisters elsewhere. But this passage tells us about the God who's greater than whatever we face. The, the addressees are seven messianic communities in the diaspora. Um, the majority of, of Jewish people in antiquity, like the majority of people today, lived in the diaspora. Uh, now, Revelation is written after 70, and even a higher percentage of Jewish people lived in the diaspora after 70 because of the devastations in, in Judea. Uh, a, a large number of them migrated northward into Syria, probably some to Alexandria, which didn't really prove a good idea given the massacres that happened there later. Um, and a number of them migrated to Asia Minor, uh, what the, uh, a Roman province in, in Western Asia Minor, actually, um, Ephesus was one of the leading cities of that. So we know that believers flourish there. Acts chapter 19 and verse 10 tells us that all the Jewish people and Greeks who lived in the Roman province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. And Pliny's epistle to Trajan, written somewhere in the early second century, so you know, maybe a couple decades after the book of Revelation, complains that the temples of the gods are being forsaken because so many people are turning to monotheism because of this movement of followers of Yeshua. Now, the 
the seven cities where these, these congregations are located, they're, they're representative. The word will spread from these. These are seven of the most strategic cities of the region. I mean, places like New York would be in the US or Philadelphia, or Chicago, or um, uh, LA or Dallas, Fort Worth or whatever. Um, so the Asiarchs meeting cities were, the, the Asiarchs were the leading uh, officials from Asia Minor. They had seven cities they would meet in annually. They'd switch off from one to the other. The, the seven cities that Yohanan addresses are almost the same. The only difference is uh, Thyatira instead of Sisychus, which is actually more central. So even more strategic in the sense. Why does he start with Ephesus? Uh, Ephesus actually, uh, this picture, I, I do need to tell you, it looked a bit better back then. But anyway, um, Patmos, where John was exiled by the Roman government, was just 40 to 50 miles southwest of Ephesus. So the harbor of Ephesus was the first place that a messenger coming from the island of Patmos in the Aegean would, would go to. And then the other cities are pretty much in, in order that you'd follow uh, if you were going from one to the next in the easiest geographic manner. Now, he probably didn't have seven secretaries to dictate to. Uh, normally you dictate and somebody would take the dictation, but if you mass production was having a room full of, of scribes who would take dictation uh, all at the same time. Um, so one copy of the scroll may have been read in each of the Messianic communities in succession, at least until uh, more, more copies would be made. Probably one copy was kept behind. They probably had two copies to begin with. But the words would spread beyond the seven cities, including other important cities with Jewish populations like Hierapolis, Tralis, and Magnesia. Those were on the same roads. And from these seven cities, one could reach all the great population centers of, of Roman Asia. Well, in 1-4, in this greeting, grace and peace, actually was a Jewish greeting. The, uh, you know, we think of the Jewish greeting in Hebrew, of course, is Shalom or Shalom Alechem or Shalom Laka, depending on how many people you're addressing. Um, and Shalom doesn't just mean literally peace. Uh, that's how we translate it with one word, but, you know, welfare, may, may all be well with you, may, may things go well with you. And it's also an implicit prayer. It's, it's implicitly invoking God, may God give you peace. Well, the Greek greeting, uh, Greeks also had often in their letters, they would have prayers to deities toward the opening, but the Greek greeting was kyrain, uh, greetings. <laughs> uh, and it becomes often in the Barita Rishab becomes charis, grace. Now, there were some Jewish documents when they were written in Greek, they used both. That became standard among early believers, but like uh, in, in the Maccabean literature and uh, also in second Baruch, um, you know, mercy and peace be with you or, or, or so on. Well, so these, these initial greetings in the letters of Shaul, of Paul, or here in Revelation, these initial greetings are not surprising you know, grace and peace be, be with you. And that would be understood as a, as a good Jewish greeting. What becomes surprising, what becomes different is that this prayer invokes not only the Father, but also the Son. Uh, grace and peace be with you from God the Father and our Lord Yeshua uh, and, and so on. And, uh, also in this, in this introductory greeting, in Revelation chapter one, verses four and eight, those verses frame the, the title of, of the rest of the title of the one who sends the greeting, <coughs> the one who is and who was and who is to come. That expands on Exodus 3.14, I am. Well, how do you bring out the, the implications of I am? Well, the Targum, which was the Aramaic paraphrase that was used in, in many synagogues, uh, expanded that as the one who is 
and who was, and who is to come. So again, a good Jewish greeting stresses God's eternality. And this would be very, a very important reminder, especially as the Messianic community was facing persecution from the state in some, in some locations and uh, seduction from false prophets and so on elsewhere. <clears throat> I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Alpha and Omega is beginning and the ending. Alpha and Omega were, of course, the first and last letters of the, of the Greek alphabet. <clears throat> now, this is uh, a dynamic equivalent translation of a, a common Jewish expression in Hebrew. Uh, I don't know how common it was, but you do find it in various rabbis and so on. Judean writers spoke of God as the Aleph and the Tav, the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And some later ones spoke of him as the Aleph and the Mem and the Tav, the first, middle, and last letters. And together they spell truth. <laughs> I am the truth. But uh, Judean writers used Aleph and Tav, which, you know, the Greek equivalent for diaspora Jewish believers would be Alpha and Omega. And that was a way of alluding back to what you have in Isaiah a few times. This is what Adonai says. I am uh, your, your redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. He's Lord over time, he's eternal. So I'm, again, I'm skipping a lot, but going to the narrative introduction. Um, Normally in ancient literature, it was common to have a narrative introduction that sets the scene for, for what was, uh, what led up to whatever you're going to talk about, whether it's a covenant, a treaty, uh, a court case, um, your speech about something. In this case, John's experience of revelation, the vision, the visions that he has on the island of Patmos, where he's been uh, exiled by the, the Roman government. Patmos was in the Cyclades and the Sporides. Uh, these were uh, two island chains that, that the Roman government often used to banish political exiles. So it sets the scene, gives a vision of the Messiah and glory, and then you have the um, introduction of the letters to the seven Messianic communities. Now, the island of Patmos was not a place you'd go for a pleasure cruise back then. <laughs> He's there on account of preaching the word of God. And this is probably written in the reign of the Emperor Domitian, who was known for banishing lots of people <laughs> to uh, islands. So um, John says, and I saw him among the lampstands. That was typical language for visions. You have it in Ezekiel, uh, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. Uh, you have it in Daniel, you have it in First Enoch and, and so on. Seven branched lampstand, menorah was the most common symbol of Israel and the Jewish faith, including in Asia Minor. Uh, I'm going through a number of ancient Jewish inscriptions in uh, Corpus Inscriptionum, uh, Yudhikaram, a three-volume three collection, as I recall. I may be mixing it up with the one Papar arm. Anyway, I read both of those, but going through those, you know, you don't find Star of David until maybe uh, uh, sixth century Spain or something, but you find in this period, the standard symbol for Judaism and for the synagogue was the menorah. It's all over the place, pervasive. And uh, it was also used by Samaritans and others who considered themselves true heirs of Israel's heritage. That's the symbol that's used for these Messianic communities, for the seven churches of Asia Minor. They see themselves still as Jewish, and that needs to be taken into account when we, when we read the book. doesn't mean they didn't have Gentiles among them, but they understood they, were, they converted to a Jewish faith. So you have the vision of Yeshua in verses 13 through 16. The goal of uh, Jewish mystics in this period was especially to see the throne of God. They said Ezekiel saw it, 
Isaiah saw it, Isaiah 6, Ezekiel 1. We want to see that. And so uh, here you have a vision uh, toward the beginning of the book, but it's a vision of Yeshua. And his robe and girdle probably allude to the high priest. Uh, of course, if you know Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. It goes on to talk about a priest after the order of Melchizedek. So, you know, he's, he's exalted as a priest. But the source of most of these images is Daniel uh, with stuff mixed in from Ezekiel. <coughs> uh, some, of, some of it comes from the angel of Daniel 10. Some of it, especially the, the uh, title comes from the reigning son of man. And some of it comes from the ancient of days, uh, also in Daniel 7. Daniel 10, you have uh, a look, behold, before me was a man dressed in linen, the belt of the finest gold around his waist, um, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, voice like the voice of a multitude. Well, does that mean Yeshua is just an angel? Since he, you know, the language of an angel is, is used? Not really, uh, it, but his glory is certainly no less than that of an angel. Uh, but the bronze limbs may also recall Ezekiel 1.7, where um, you have uh, God's throne chariot. Their, their feet were like those of a calf, gleamed like burnished bronze. The glowing metal can also depict God's own glory in Ezekiel 1.27, where he looked like glowing metal as if full of fire. Uh, brilliant light surrounded him. The voice like many waters may be like the sound of the multitude in Daniel 10, but it actually is closer in this case to God's own voice in Ezekiel, um, where his voice was at the sound of, of many rushing waters, Ezekiel 1, 24 and 43, 2. The title goes back to Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Uh, the context in Daniel, you've got four beasts that represent four human empires, four, four kingdoms. But then you have one that's not like an animal. Instead, it's one like a, a son of man, one like a human being, it looks like a human being. And he represents the final kingdom, the kingdom of God. And uh, he, he stands in part for the saints of the Most High. So he stands in part for, for God's people uh, who, will, who, who suffer under the horn in the context uh, in Daniel, but also are exalted in the kingdom, but he also is one who receives worship, Daniel says. So it's like a confluence of the human and the divine, which of course works really well for <laughs> the one about whom we're speaking. And to him is given authority and power to rule forever. Um, and of course, you know, you, you know that was uh, stated also for the Davidic dynasty but, you know, if, if the Davidic Messiah didn't come by the first century, well, we're kind of in trouble with that promise being fulfilled because 2,000 years later, who knows that they really descended from David? I mean, anyway, um, Daniel, Daniel 7, uh, God is the ancient of days. His hair is like, like wool, like white snow, and um, his throne was flaming with fire. So all this comes together in this vision that introduces Yeshua in um, Revelation chapter 1, verses 13 through 16. And then we have Yeshua's message in verses 17 through 20. The first and the last. Don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. Now, he's, he's also the firstborn in chapter 1 and verse 5. But saying he's the first and the last means something way more than that. That's equivalent to Alpha and Omega, to Aleph and Tav. Um, again, based on what you have in Isaiah, I'm the first and the last apart from me. There is no God. Uh, so, of course, this brings up one of the <laughs> traditional um, issues uh, within uh, faith in Yeshua. How come these early Jewish followers of Yeshua believed that God himself has, had visited them in flesh in some sense. Um, and of course, that's been a controversy ever since then that we won't be able to solve now. But, you know, there is, there is some precedent for it in the Tanakh. 
uh, in Isaiah 9, I believe in Isaiah 20, or, sorry, Jeremiah 23, although I, I know there's a way that could be explained differently. But that's another, another story that uh, I'll defer to those who are uh, Isaiah experts, and I'll, I should stick to Revelation here. But anyway, um, triumph over death. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of death and Hades. Living one was a standard title for God in ancient Jewish literature. Here applied to Yeshua. Uh, definitely the living one. He's, he's overcome death. And the keys of death and Hades. Now, in an ancient palace, usually there was just a single pair of keys. Uh, and they, they didn't actually look like this. They were actually pretty big. So that... Uh, you know, it was kind of inconvenient for anybody to carry them around. It was one important official, the major domo, who would carry them around. Uh, Greek and Hebrew uh, spoke of Hades kind of interchangeably with death or the realm of death. So coming to the gates of Hades was dying in, in Greek parlance. When the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek, you have similar languages. Gates of Sheol becomes Gates of Hades when it's translated into Greek. Um, gates of Death also uh, similar language can be, become gates of, gates of Hades. So Yeshua holds the keys of death and Hades. He's the one who, who ultimately has the power of life and death. Don't be afraid of what the emperor can do to you. <laughs> Stand firm. Deities of the underworld Hades, or in Latin Pluto, or Anubis, or Egyptians, were often portrayed as holding the keys to the underworld. But in Jewish teaching, only God held the keys to life and death. So in Wisdom of Solomon, which is a, a probably diaspora, probably Alexandrian Jewish document uh, from, I think, the first century before Yeshua, uh, there's different opinions on the dating, but you have the authority over life and death and you lead down to the gates of Hades and you bring up from there. And uh, later rabbis spoke of God holding the keys of rain and the keys of resurrection and, and so on. So Yeshua is portrayed as divine. Um, if you know he's your Lord, you don't have to be afraid of what anybody says to you or about you. I know it's hard sometimes, uh, uh, especially uh, if you write, you get interesting reviews, but it's a lot better than what I used to get. when I first was converted from atheism and became a believer in Yeshua. <clears throat> Sometimes they got beaten on the streets for my witness. Um, by the way, uh, that, it, didn't, it never happened to me in New York. <laughs> happened to me in a small town in Ohio and a medium-sized town in Missouri. But, but in New York, you know, I had one guy, he, he, he got really upset with me. Um, this was in Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn. Uh, he, was, he was not Jewish. Uh, he, he, he said, you know, you're, you're talking about eternal life. You said you're ready to die. We'll see how ready to die you are. I've got a gun in my pocket. I'm going to blow your brains out. We'll see how ready you are to die. And I was like, sir, I, I really wish you wouldn't do that um, because I'm, I'm sharing good news with you. I, I, I prefer to be around to share it with other people. Uh, my heart was really going boom, 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 boom. <laughs> I mean, I know where I'm going, but I really did have hopes that I could do more in this life. Anyway, and he's saying, yeah, you're just scared. You're just scared. And he walks away. And he comes back the next night. He says, sorry, man, about yesterday. I was a little drunk. But hey, you know, we want to come visit your church there. So anyway, uh, <laughs> so, um, but just to say, we have eternal life. So we don't have to be intimidated. You have letters to seven messianic communities. Uh, some have compared them to imperial edicts to cities. You also have prophetic letters in the Tanakh. You have oracles to various nations. You have oracles to various cities. So there's a lot of precedent for this. But again, Yeshua is depicted here as divine. In the biblical prophets, you have Koamar Adonai. Well, in Greek, that's uh, Tadelege, uh, Kur uh, Kurios. Well, that's what you have here. Yeshua is speaking and saying, thus says, and then you have descriptions of him. 
and these are prophecies from him. And then you have descriptions of him that echo the descriptions in, in chapter one. So I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna do a couple of these. Smyrna, be faithful to death. Uh, you have a city of contrasts. The one who's speaking is the first and the last who was dead but came to life and says, you were, you were poor, but really in God's sight, you were rich. How do you like that rich? Uh, and you were persecuted by those who claim to be Jews, but are not. And, and that you, like Yeshua, will find life in the face of death. Now, this is not talking about Jewish people putting Jewish believers to death. The thing is though, if you get kicked out of the synagogue, synagogue communities were exempt from having to worship the emperor. But you get kicked out of the synagogue and you were told to, um, you know, the, the, you're, you're disavowed by your own Jewish community. And somebody reports you to the Roman authorities, this person's not participating in, in emperor worship. You could get in a lot of trouble. Uh, and we know that from Pliny's epistle to Trajan, it would be epistle 1096, um, where like a couple decades later, he's saying, yeah, these Christians, they were so arrogant, they, they wouldn't worship your image. And so because they refused to worship your image, I had to put them to death. Um, <clears throat> but he goes on. He says, who say they are Jews, but are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Now, you can see how this was radically abused by anti-Semites through history. And while some people think the language itself is anti-Semitic. Um, so, but you actually go back and read language from first century sources. You do have plenty of anti-Semitic things. Things like um, Apian, who's, who's refuted in uh, Josephus's apologetic writings against Apian, you know, stuff like the blood libel and other anti-Semitic things in history. Apian was already, he was an Egyptian author, was already saying those things. Th this is not anti-Egyptian, by the way. This was one Egyptian author. But anyway, going back to, um, you know, these things go back to Apian. A lot, a lot of these things uh, were already being said by anti-Semites in that period. But then you read things from one Jewish group criticizing another Jewish group. And so here are synagogues that have expelled the believers, believers who believe that they are worshiping the true Messiah, they're worshiping the true God in the, in the, in the right way, and that those who've kicked them out are being influenced by Hasatan. And this kind of language was used by competing Jewish groups against other Jewish groups. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, in the, in the Qumran hymns, they speak of the rest of Israel as a community or a congregation of Belial, that is a congregation of Satan. So almost this, well, basically, if you're translating from, from Hebrew, the same language was being used in the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is certainly not anti-Semitic, because it's a Jewish group condemning another Jewish group. Now you may disagree with them. You may say, no, you're the community of Satan, but you can't say that they're not Jewish. And the same way um, these, uh, these messianic communities saw themselves still as Jewish. Again, they're portraying themselves as lampstands. You may say, well, not our Judaism, but these were still people who identified with the heritage of Israel and considered themselves to be Jewish or Gentile converts who considered themselves to be converts to Judaism, although not with circumcision, probably. That's another story that would, yeah, if I digress on that, we'll never get to Revelation. So I'll leave that with, you can read my Galatians commentary if you want. But um, Well, just to say this, they believed that what circumcision as the seal of the covenant pointed to uh, ultimately with the new covenant was the gift of the spirit. That's the ultimate seal of the covenant. And if you've got that, then at least, well, actually this was a debate among Jewish believers in the first century, but the ultimate uh, perspective that was argued for by Paul was, you've got the spirit, so the outward sign is superfluous. It's not bad if you want it, but it's superfluous. Uh, and you know, if, if you're Jewish, it's good. If you're Gentile, don't do it as if you need it. So anyway, uh, I, but you know, today a lot of us are circumcised medically anyway, so 
that's cool. Good idea. But anyway, the Messianic communities still saw themselves as Jewish. Uh, there were other places where they were tolerated. So I mentioned earlier Sardis. The Jewish community there was, was accepted in their community. Uh, they had the prime piece of real estate in the city. This is a, a model of it in, in the Diaspora Museum in Tel Aviv. But uh, the tolerance seems to have negatively impacted at least the Messianic community there. They were, they were accepted, but some places where you're persecuted makes you more zealous. Uh, and sometimes when everybody just says, oh, you're okay, we like you, uh, you can get too lax. And that seems to have happened to the uh, believers in Sardis. So I'm not, not, not saying, yes, everybody please persecute us. No, I'm not saying that. But <laughs> if it happens, hey, there's, a, there's an upside to it. So uh, he, he says that uh, uh, you need to persevere lest you be blotted out from the book of life. Well, that's language that goes back to Exodus 32 where Moses says, God, you know, rather blot me out of your life than your people. Paul says something similar to that in, in Romans chapter uh, 10, where he says, I love my people so much, I, I, would, uh, I would be a curse for them. Or, uh, sorry, Romans 9, and then he says something like that in 10. The heavenly book of life is something that already appears in the Tanakh. I'm not sure exactly what it means in some of those passages, but it's developed further in Jewish literature, first Danic jubilees. These were uh, from a couple of centuries before the uh, Berit HaRashah, uh, Qumran War Scroll, and, and of course the rabbis develop it also. And hearers, local hearers in Asia Minor might also think of citizen registers, where if somebody was gonna be executed in a city in Asia Minor, sometimes they would blot out the names of the citizens before they would execute them. So they wouldn't have to say they executed one of their own citizens. In, in Revelation 4, John sees that worship participates in the activity of heaven. And you have something similar to that in the Dead Sea Scrolls, where the community would pray at certain times to participate in the angelic liturgy. Well, we don't, we don't have them doing that in Revelation, like certain times, but they, they intend to participate in the activity of heaven. Heaven is a place of worship. And so when we're worshiping God, that's like, that can be like a foretaste of heaven. Uh, through the spirit. Heaven is, is depicted in temple terms in the book of Revelation. So the image we used for it, you've got the tabernacle, you've got the Ark of the Covenant, you've got the incense altar, incense, incense bulls, the altar of sacrifice, the lampstands, the sea, and the harps for worship. Where do you have all those in the Tanakh? In the temple. Uh, the, the tabernacle, uh, Revelation 15, I looked in heaven, saw the tabernacle of the testimony. Well, by this time, the, the earthly temple has been destroyed. So this would be a great encouragement to Jewish believers, but we still have this heavenly temple. And of course, Jewish sources talked about a heavenly temple, and, and it's been argued uh, that even in Exodus 25, 8, you know, build it according to this form. Well, in the ancient Near East, the earthly form was often meant to... Uh, or resemble the heavenly form of the deity. Uh, you have that both in Ugaritic and uh, Babylonian sources and apparently Egyptian sources as well. The Ark of the Covenant, 1119, uh, God's, God's temple within his Ark, uh, his, uh, sorry, his Ark of the Covenant was seen within his temple and uh, also even the throne in Revelation because in the Tanakh, the throne was often depicted as the Ark. God is enthroned above the cherubim. Uh, and I could talk about the ancient Near Eastern significance of that as well. But incense altars uh, normally had four horns in the ancient Near East. Well, that was true in, in Israel's temple as well. But the, the incense altars, uh, you've got golden bowls full of incense. The prayers of the saints are like incense that rise up before God in Revelation 5 and Revelation 8. You have an altar of sacrifice. I saw under the altar the souls of those who'd been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. Why are they under the altar? Uh, and you have the altar mentioned elsewhere. Why would, why would they be under the altar? Well, uh, I may get to this later, but in case I don't get to Revelation 6, the altar 
in Leviticus was the place where the blood would be poured out. The blood would be poured out at the base of the altar. Here are these souls, these, these believers who've died, who've been martyred. They're under the altar because they're being portrayed as sacrifices, as living sacrifices before God. You have that in the Maccabean literature, by the way, where uh, those who are being martyred for keeping the Torah by uh, Antiochus Epiphanes are saying, uh, may our life be a sacrifice and may God turn away his wrath from, from Israel when he sees what we have suffered on behalf of our people and our law. Lampstands, of course you had to have lampstands in, in temples because they were secluded from the, from the light of the surrounding world uh, throughout the ancient East. And so, you know, you didn't want the priests tripping and falling all over the place. They had to have lampstands, right? So you have that in, in Israel's temple too. And you have that uh, before the throne, seven lamps were, were blazing. And the sea, this wasn't in the tabernacle, but you do have it in Solomon's temple, Shlomo's temple. Um, before the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal in Revelation. Well, it was a sea of bronze uh, before uh, Solomon's temple, because the temple uh, in, in the ancient Near East, including in Israel, often would symbolize the deity's rule over the cosmos. So it makes sense here. Um, uh, I could go on even with this in Revelation, but uh, I have to stay disciplined so I can cover as much as possible. Harps for worship. Uh, the four living creatures fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp. Uh, they're playing with harps in chapter 14. Uh, chapter 15, seeing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Well, of course, you had the priests and the Levites using harps in the temple. What do people often do in temples? They, they worship. So Revelation portrays heaven as a temple. It depicts heaven as a place of, of worshiping God. And we, we get to have a foretaste of that now. Why is the New Jerusalem shaped like a cube? Uh, New Jerusalem, of course, is Isaiah 65, uh, 66. Uh, God makes a new heavens and a new earth and a new Jerusalem in which righteousness dwells. And then, of course, Jubilees and First Enoch and other Jewish sources. And the rabbis talked about it. Uh, rabbis used Isaiah 54 with the, um, the different precious stones, just like you have in Revelation 21. Well, why is New Jerusalem shaped like a cube here in the book of Revelation? Well, in scripture, the Holy of Holies was shaped like a cube. And so what it means is that we will dwell forever in God's presence without distraction. You have these throne creatures, these creatures before God's throne. They resemble a mixture between Isaiah's seraphim, the burning ones, and Ezekiel's cherubim, just like the cherubim, uh, the, the uh, gold cherubim in Exodus. But here we see God's throne in person <laughs> The, the real real uh, version, not the symbolic one, uh, Ezekiel's cherubim supporting God's throne. And it draws in the most regal and powerful of creatures. And they're full of eyes all around. Ezekiel 118 also, all four rims of the creatures were full of eyes all around. Nothing on earth is hidden from them. You may also have an allusion to uh, Zechariah there. But glorious as these creatures are, they serve no other purpose but to extol, or no other recorded purpose anyway, but to extol the greatness of God. Praise matters. God created diverse creations to give him glory. Sometimes uh, in, in, in figurative language, it speaks of even the trees clapping their hands, the trees of the field. And uh, I can hear birds singing in the background here. And, and you know what? He, he, he makes he makes just a sec that is not uh the sound is turned off on my phone i'm sorry it did that despite the sound being turned off anyway uh but you the the glory of 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 worship is so important that and, and, and the creature is so diverse you are the only one who can give God the glory that God designed you to give him. So 
he yearns for your praise. He wants your praise, it matters to him. Well, they cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who is and who was and who is to come. Well, this holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, that goes back to Isaiah, uh, Isaiah chapter six, when he's a holy priest in, in the holiest nation on the face of the earth. But when he sees the Lord high and lifted up, he cries out, I am unclean, a man of unclean lips. I dwell among a people of unclean lips. Because when God is the standard, all of us recognize we're just dust and ashes before him and, and how we need to, to give him glory, the glory of which he alone is due. Now in chapter five, we come to the lion and the lamb. And you know, the lion is this regal creature and presumably alludes to the Lion of Judah in Genesis 49, how the, the uh, throne, the, the ruling dynasty will come from, from Judah. And fourth Ezra, a Jewish document, sometime maybe a little before, a little after Revelation, uh, speaks of the Messiah as, as this roaring lion. Throughout the Mediterranean world, the lion was an image of power and conquest. But John hears about this conquering lion and he turns and he sees how the lion is overcome. Not by force, not by violence, not by shutting down the Roman empire by, by force and slaughtering all the, all the Romans. He came instead and submitted himself to death. And in the midst of tragedy, in the midst of brokenness, in the midst of weakness, God revealed his power, inaugurating the eschatological, the, the promised end time resurrection. Um, so Yeshua, Yeshua is the conquering lion, but the way he conquered was by submitting himself to death. Lambs were typically images of helplessness. Slaughtered lamb, you can't get much more helpless than that. Slaughtered lamb was a symbol of sacrifice. Revelation is going to go on to speak of plagues, very similar in nature to the kind of plagues you have on Egypt in, in the book of Exodus, uh, now being cast in the whole world. But the Passover lamb's blood protects God's people from these plagues. So again, you see it's, it's echoing scripture over and over again, just immersed in the imagery of scripture. Yeshua is the model for sacrificial martyrdom. So in chapter six, where you have the souls into the altar being portrayed as sacrifices, it's on behalf of the lamb in, in solidarity with the lamb. And this is a, a pivotal example of Revelation's reapplication of traditional Jewish symbolism that you often had in apocalypses and elsewhere. Also, you have these hymns of redemption, Revelation 5.9. Um, God made us a kingdom and priests. Well, Israel sang hymns to commemorate Passover redemption, uh, especially Psalms 113 through 118, the, the Hallel were used in that way. <clears throat> but by the blood of the Passover lamb, now he speaks of a larger kingdom and priests uh, here redeemed from all peoples. In, in Exodus, I should go back, in Exodus chapter 19, verses four through six, when God redeems his people from Egypt, he says, I've made you a kingdom and a priests and priests to worship me. Uh, a kingdom of priests, uh, the Targum puts it the other way. So, um, but here he says, I've, I've redeemed a people for myself from among all these peoples. And so in other words, it's like in Isaiah 19, uh, it's in um, you know, other passages in the, in the prophets where God will bring in uh, the nations, they'll, they'll stream, and the law will go forth from Mount Zion and teach all the nations. Well, it doesn't mean everybody from all the nations, but everybody who will submit to the one true God of Israel. And, and we're seeing this happen here. The, the biblical world uh, was the, uh, the, 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 the biblical world that's narrated in the Bible, the Mediterranean world, East Africa, Western Asia, but they also knew of China, they knew of India, uh, there were trade relations with these places. Africa, further south of, uh, of there, there were trade relations. Um, they, 
By this period, they knew of Germans and Britons. They may have known of Iceland, if that's what Thule means in ancient sources. It was inconceivable that all these peoples would be evangelized, that all these peoples would become followers of the one true God, given, given the odds that were against it by, by any human means. But I mean, even in this past century, you look at what's happened uh, with the shift of the majority of believers in the world right now live in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Um, of course, the Americas weren't part of the uh, world that people knew of, uh, whether in New York or here where I'm living. But anyway, uh, but it encompasses all the world, it speaks of nations, kindreds, peoples, and tongues. Revelation includes this fourfold formula seven times. And it matches a formula that you have six times in the book of Daniel with nations and kindreds and peoples. Uh, it's threefold usually there, but, the, but in the Greek translation of Daniel, the first time it's fourfold. Now, in some of those passages in Daniel, it's worshiping the image of that Nebuchadnezzar set up. In some of the passages in Revelation, it's worshiping the image of the beast. But in other passages, in Daniel chapter seven, people from every kindred and tribe and nation will worship the son of man. And in Revelation also. So you have good multicultural and bad multicultural. <laughs> you have uh, evil, the spirit of evil empire in the world, but you also have people from all peoples gathering. God had created this diversity and all this diversity will be represented before his throne. So uh, yeah, Daniel, Daniel 7, 14, the son of man rules all these peoples. Uh, Revelation 6, the seals of judgment. Lists of judgments were not unusual in apocalypses and prophecies. They characterize uh, messianic woes, uh, the birth pangs of the Messiah in Jewish expectation in uh, uh, Babylonian Talmud, Sanhedrin, 97 to 98 thereabouts, um, and in a lot of other Jewish, Jewish documents, earlier, earlier Jewish sources don't always use quite the same language, but lists of four plagues resemble some lists in the Tanakh, although three judgments are, are more common there. Um, one of them, the, the red horse, uh, probably goes back to Zechariah. Actually, Zechariah speaks of, of these different horses, uh, these different riders, uh, kind of angelic, and you have something like that here, but the red horse symbolizes uh, judgment. Uh, later rabbis spoke of Zechariah's red horse as turning the world into blood. So again, these images would be very familiar, very comprehensible to a first century Jewish audience. Um, famine, uh, I'm gonna skip, I hate to skip some of these things. Death in a pale horse, uh, death often personified was often personified as an angel in Jewish sources, the angel of death. So um, the evocative impact of such judgment rhetoric in Jewish sources and in Revelation is, get your life together, don't wait till it's too late. Uh, martyrs as sacrifices, we talked about that already, why they were under the altar. The sixth seal, um, earthquakes was a uh, judgment often that's in the Tanakh. Uh, it, you often have these, well, in Asia Minor, actually, this was, you know, Asia Minor was a little bit like uh, parts of California. Uh, they were, they had a lot of earthquakes. Uh, in fact, um, Laodicea had actually been devastated by one a generation earlier, but never one this big. And you know, people were terrified by the obscuring of sun or moon, but this is no mere eclipse. It's, it's uh, what you have where the sun is turned black like sackcloth, the, the moon turns blood red. This is language from the book of Joel. Um, again, when he speaks of the stars and the sky fell to the earth as late figs drop from a fig tree, this is uh, figurative language from the book of Isaiah for the, the coming day of judgment, the day of the Lord. When, when God is gonna put everything right, he's gonna bring justice and, and then peace. To, to the world. Um, this is not talking about uh, all the stars suddenly converting to black holes and then traveling at, at trillions of times the speed of light and all impacting the earth. I mean, it's not literal cosmology, it's, uh, but it's figurative for, you know, you better get things together. 
calling to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. That's from Hosea chapter 10 and verse 8, from Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 19. Um, the difference being that it explicitly mentions the Lamb specifically. Um, 617, the great day of the wrath has come, and who can stand? Caves and mountains were useful for hiding from human enemies, but such hiding places were futile before the, the one who moves mountains, uh, as he, he just mentioned, the, the earthquakes moving mountains. Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. I mean, lambs are normally very docile. So wrath of the lamb is a very jarring image. The great day of the wrath has come. Who can stand? Echoes Zephaniah 118. Nothing will save them on the day of the Lord's wrath. Um, Joel 211. Today, uh, truly the day of the Lord is great. Terrible indeed. Who can endure it? Malachi 3 2. Who can endure the day of his coming? But the answer comes in chapter 7. Who can endure it? God's servants, those made pure by the blood of the Lamb. Do I have to stop? Uh, okay. you, want, you want a little more time? You, you, you uh, want, what do you want? Uh, I what you want. Oh, I'll always take more time. I mean, I. I can go I'll all night. You, I'll, give you, I'll give you five more, five more minutes. Five more minutes, thanks. Uh, you know what? I'm going to skip chapter seven, though. Uh, I'm going to go on to, oh, no, I don't want to skip seven. OK. Um, all right, well, we'll get through what we can get through. Sorry. Um, I had a joke about the 144,000 being Jehovah's Witnesses and then saying, no, not really. Um, but. Uh, their, their earlier view of themselves. The 144,000 are standing on Mount Zion. So these are the New Jerusalemites. These are the people who dwell in the New Jerusalem. And they're, they're chaste. You have a, a male version of the pure New Jerusalem adorned for her husband. Yohanan uh, explicitly reuses these numbers, 144 and 12,000. He uses them in describing in Greek, the dimensions of the New Jerusalem later on. Now, there's two views of this that are common. One is you've got Messianic Jews in Revelation 7, 1 to 8, and then you have those who are grafted in from among all the nations in 7, 9 to 17. The other, the other view is you have believers from all peoples depicted as grafted into God's people in 7, 1 to 8, and then the same in a more literal way in 7, 9 to 17. Um, ultimately, either way, you know, it's, it's depicting something that has a Jewish heritage and a Jewish basis, because as you go on in 7, 9 through 17, uh, I'm going to skip that, um, you have an innumerable multitude from many nations, maybe echoing the promise of Abraham's descendants, the great tribulation echoes Daniel 12, but also, though neither hunger nor thirst, nor will the sun beat on them, um, he's going to lead them to springs of living water. That's Isaiah 49, and again, Revelation 7. And you also have, um, he's going to wipe away every tear from their eyes. He's going to protect them from, from these things. Um, the wiping away every tear from their eyes goes back to Isaiah 25, 8. So again, these promises are echoing uh, what you have in Isaiah, but there's two differences. One is, and when it speaks of Adonai, it speaks of Yeshua and the Father together. And the other is that the promise for Israel's restoration now welcomes uh, believers from all peoples who are willing to follow Israel's God and follow Israel's Messiah. And uh, much, and th this is something that's already in the Tanakh. Um, Isaiah 19, on that day, Israel will be third with Egypt and Assyria, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my heritage. Isaiah 56, don't let the foreigner joined to the Lord say, the Lord will surely separate me from his people. Proselytes were welcome. Foreigners would join themselves to the Lord, and my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Zechariah 2, sing and rejoice, O daughter Zion. For lo, I will come, I will dwell in your midst. Many nations will join themselves to the Lord in that day and shall be my people, and I will dwell in your midst, and you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Now, of course, that's not the majority of passages. The majority of passages, God is addressing Israel and saying, I'm going to restore you. 
don't be afraid. But part of the promise is also, yeah, the Gentiles are going to come and acknowledge your God too, and they'll be grafted in. And I'd love to talk about the plagues, including the locusts, but I think it's better to end on a happy note and uh, just say, uh, I, uh, we, we have the hope of the new Jerusalem. And so um, I actually was going to be in Israel uh, in a couple days, but due to the virus, uh, don't get to be there in a couple days, but hopefully next year. Uh, so we can say next year in Jerusalem, uh, but if not this way, may it be when uh, God uh, restores all of his people, all the Jewish people, uh, and all the, all the Gentiles who've come to believe in the Jewish Messiah, brings us back together uh, in, in the time of uh, Zechariah 14, when, when the Lord comes, the Mount of Olives, and um, yes, we look forward to that time. Amen. Amen. In, in fact, I actually... Let, let me just give this one last thing. This is one experience I had. This is not when I was was in New York, the time you talked about, but another time uh, I was there with some other some other people. We were just uh, having a tour through uh, a couple of Jewish members, and then the rest of us were Gentiles. But we had a we're having like a, we're, we were visiting a Lubavitch uh, gathering there, a Lubavitch community, and. Uh, a Lubavitch um, student, he was studying to be a rabbi. His partner was away in Paris that day. And so he gave us a tour of the community, uh, including a, a matzah factory and so on. And when it concluded, um, we, we had a prayer together. And um, I think it was a, a Jewish, Jewish believer in Yeshua who who gave the closing prayer uh, and prayed that for the day when all of us will be gathered together uh, as, you know, worshiping, worshiping God together. And it was just a special time because that was also his hope too. Uh, mm. For those of us who believe Mashiach has come and is coming, but his hope, his earnest hope for Mashiach to come, you know, uh, we were able to pray together in light of that hope. And on that day, his name shall be one. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Zachariah. Yes. Well, uh, Dr. Keener, thank you so much. That was that was fantastic. That was great. Um, a, a thrilling, wild ride through Revelation. <laughs> yeah, but uh, we have lots of questions. So uh, you ready? Uh, you want yeah, to you have to answer the hard ones. <laughs> yeah, I told you I'm not doing that. <laughs> if you can't answer them, <laughs> forget it. <laughs> um, but uh, but there, there we got lots of questions here. So uh, are you ready? to take a drink of water? Do you want to catch your breath? What do you want to do? Go ahead. I can I can drink while you ask. So okay okay. All right. Um, first question, common question: uh, can, can the letters to the churches be applied to the different churches today? Um, oh. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's that should be fairly easy because at the end of each of the letters, uh, of course. Uh, the Ruach HaKodesh was associated with, with the spirit of prophecy. So at the end of each of the letters, it says, let, let the one who has ears hear what the spirit says to the Messianic communities, to the churches. So all the churches are invited to read each other's mail, so to speak. Uh, they could all learn from one another, even though the message given to a particular church was more relevant to that church than to the other ones. And, and today too, I mean, all of us have different tests. Uh, different churches have different tests, different, the church in different parts of the world has different tests. We individually have different tests, but there's a, a summons given to each of them, a promise given to each of them to the one who overcomes. So all of us are called to, to follow our Lord in overcoming whatever our test is. We don't get to choose our tests, but we, uh, we're called to overcome. Do you think that these churches represent different ages of the church and, and uh, church history? No. Okay. <laughs> I just want to make sure because yeah, that may yeah. have been on, on, that may have been the thinking. Oh, okay. No, no. I don't think they. I don't think they can represent the uh, church ages because if that were the case, uh, well, 
that was a view that people came up with in the 1800s and they made, they made church history fit into that. But church history has gone on since then and it's really messed up the, <laughs> the pattern. So um, yeah. And the church okay. in different parts of the world acts very different, so. Good, now next question. Uh, I've read that the synagogue of Satan may be a, may quite literally those that say they are Jews but are not, i.e. Gentiles, maybe Gnostics who claim to be Jews. Is this a viable interpretation? It, it is one, one scholarly interpretation. It's a minority approach. Uh, I wouldn't, I would, you know, but I, I wouldn't say it's not a, a respectable approach. The problem with saying that they're Gnostics, uh, although not the, I mean, they could have been people. Well, Pre-Gnostic, yeah. Well, they, they could have been people, yeah, proto-Gnostics, but we don't have any attestation for Gnosticism per se until the second century. And you have things that, that flowed into Gnosticism, uh, Middle Platonism, uh, Jewish mysticism, and so on, but they weren't exactly Gnostic. Okay, good. Next question. What is the early Jewish understanding, if any, of the thousand year intermediate kingdom referred to in Revelation 20? Is there any basis oh. in the Tanakh for this kingdom that precedes the eternal state? Now, whether there's a basis for it in the Tanakh depends on your um, <laughs> particular theological interpretation of it. Where, um, of course, in the Tanakh, you have the, the hills flowing with wine. You have, uh, you know, a, a, an agrarian paradise, so to speak. Um, Revelation actually speaks of, well, not not in the millennium per se, but in Revelation uh, 22, you have a restoration of, of Eden, where you have uh, uh, the rivers and the, um, the no more curse and, and uh, the tree of life, uh, adapting Ezekiel in a, in a way that mixes it, Ezekiel 47 in a way that mixes it with, with Eden. Uh, but, it depends on how you interpret, because Revelation 20, where it talks about the millennium, doesn't actually specify what goes on in the millennium. But if the, if the promises uh, in the prophets, some of them are literal, and if they're not fulfilled in the eternal state, then you know the millennium is the place where you fit them in. So uh, there are different views on that. Um, the, in the second century, apparently Papias in the very early second century, Justin Martyr in the mid second century, and Irenaeus in the late second century took that literally as you know, a, an earthly kingdom, uh, apparently intermediate, they were premillennial, although even Justin Martyr admits in the mid second century, not everybody held the same view. Um, as you get into later centuries, the amillennial interpretation pre predominates. And so I won't get into all that, but just going back to the question of the intermediate state in, uh, well, actually intermediate state, we often use that to refer to um, yeah, the, the body state. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But um, uh, which Pharisees, by the way, also believed in, uh, as well as the resurrection of the body, they also believed in an intermediate state between death and the resurrection. Okay. Uh, and a number, of, a number of Jewish people did believe in that in this period. But in terms of um, believing in an intermediate kingdom, that was common in early Jewish sources. So uh, now sometimes the intermediate period was like 40 years, uh, wasn't normally a thousand years, but yeah, you, you do have a number of uh, Jewish apocalypses. And I think the rabbis also could speak of, of that. As some of the later rabbis spoke of, of the days of the Messiah and distinguished that from, from a later period. So um, all, all that to say, yes, there is precedent for it in Jewish sources. There was a continuation of that understanding in Jewish sources. Now, if you're premillennial, you'll say, aha, well, it's obvious what, what John means then. And if you're amillennial, you'll say, well, you see, it was just an apocalyptic literary device. <laughs> so we're not going to solve that one here, but uh, just to say uh, it, wa it was a, an image that was definitely understandable in that day. Okay. 
Good. Yeah, I, I'm, 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 I'm pre millennial, but I'm not, I'm not the super duper. I, I can see both sides. So, anyway. That's very helpful to me. I'm preaching on that this, this uh, Shabbat. Oh, good. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. Uh, number four uh, What are your thoughts regarding the judgments of Revelation being similar, merely on a worldwide scale, to those of Exodus? And will they play out over years or months before the greater Moses comes on the scene? Yeah. Uh, again, it depends on whether you take them symbolically or literally. Well, everybody takes them symbolically in a sense because nobody says this is just uh, all gonna happen on Egypt again. Egypt goes through enough, I mean, come on. Uh, but it's using imagery from the plagues in Egypt. So for example, what you have with um, the sores and the boils, uh, you have the sun being darkened. Uh, as, as that was one of the plagues. You also have uh, the locusts. You have uh, j just a number, a number of uh, the water turned to blood. So you have a lot of these repeated in the uh, tr judgments of the trumpets and the bulls in Revelation eight and nine, and then in Revelation, uh, well, starting in fifteen, but being poured out in sixteen. And it's interesting also. In Revelation you, chapter, you see them as being the same events. The, the no, I don't. I don't see them. I don't see them as. Ha I see them as echoing the events. I don't see them as being. He's just giving you a history lesson of what happened in Exodus. I think uh, this is. Uh, it's either referring to judgments in the course of this age, the whole course of this age, or it's referring to judgments just before the end, or it's referring to both, but. In, in Revelation chapter 11 and verse eight, it speaks of the, uh, the, the great city, which also in Revelation is called Babylon, the great city where also our Lord was crucified, uh, which is also called Sodom and Egypt. Now, geographically, that doesn't work, especially back then when you couldn't fly to places, you know, you had to walk. You can't say Babylon, Egypt, Sodom, and Jerusalem are all the same location geographically. So you realize there's figurative language going on. It's a place of judgment, like the plagues on Egypt. Um, and it's a, so it's, it's kind of the world system. Uh, all these things blended together. And well, I'm giving you my interpretation now, because when you get to Revelation on this stuff, there are so many <laughs> different interpretations. Uh, and as far as the plagues, uh, in terms of the timing, you have the timing echoing the language of the book of Daniel, uh, time times and half a time, uh, 1260 days, Daniel is 1290, um, uh, uh, 42 months. And you have this stated a number of times in the book of Revelation. So uh, if you add them all up, it's something like 10 and a half years or something, but uh, I don't add them all up, I see them I see them pretty much as covering the same area. Um, this is a period of, of great tribulation. Now, the question is, is this referring to the same one that Daniel was referring to? Uh, Jesus speaks of an abomination of desolation, tribulation like never before, uses language. Daniel used it apparently for Antiochus Epiphanes uh, in, in like 165 BCE. He uses it also for uh, though something that seems to precede the coming of the of the Lord, the, the resurrection of the righteous in chapter 12. Um, in chapter 9, he seems to be speaking of something where the anointed one is cut off. If that's referring to the Messiah, then that may be the destruction in, in 70 that, that follows that. So, I mean, <laughs> putting it all together, there's different opinions on that. But what is Revelation talking about? In Revelation chapter 12, it draws again on imagery from uh, Isaiah and elsewhere. Uh, and you have this woman who's clothed with the sun, um, obviously not, not literal because, I mean, she'd be really hot, um, obviously. We're 93 million miles away from the sun. I mean, imagine being inside it. So, um, but she's clothed with the sun. She's, she's got the moon under her feet. She, she has 12 stars in her head. 
uh, taking imagery from uh, Joseph's dream in, in Genesis 37. So clearly Israel imagery, uh, but then you have the, the, the son who's caught up to rule the nations with a rod of iron. And again, it draws on imagery from the Tanakh. Uh, but I and most interpreters take that to be Yeshua being caught up to rule the nations with the rod of iron. And then it speaks of 1,260 days. So either you've got a hiatus between Yeshua being exalted and the beginning of that period, or you've got that referring to the entire period between his first and second coming. Um, if, if it's the latter, it's taking the image of a, of a final tribulation, which we do seem to have in Second Thessalonians 2 and elsewhere, and just applying it to the whole course of this age in the world you'll have tribulation, uh, but be of good courage, I've overcome the world. Whichever way you take it, I do think that the Berith Hadashah agrees with uh, Jewish apocalyptic notions that there's an intensification of tribulation at the very end, but also because uh, repeatedly in the Berith Hadashah, we're portrayed as being in the last days. You know, the, the Messiah who's yet to come has come. We're in a period in between the times. There's also a very real sense in which uh, we have a foretaste of the future glory, but we also experience a foretaste of testing in this world. Uh, and so the, the, the book of Revelation stays very relevant to us. Uh, just like we may not be living in the time of Exodus, but we can learn from what people went through there. Whether we're living in the time that Revelation is depicting or not, and I'm staying neutral on this because there's not really time to go into it, um, people have different views, but whether, whether we are in that time or not, we can certainly learn from it. Um, it's, a, it it's a model for us, how we need to be ready to serve the Lord no matter what and trust God's sovereignty no matter what. Okay, oh, good. That, this, we got, got a couple more, few more questions here. Okay, that's great. <laughs> no, that, that's helpful. Uh, why would God release Satan to tempt believers again at the end of the millennium? Can believers lose their salvation at that time? <laughs> uh, you're asking, asking me questions. I don't know if I'm, am I allowed to talk about these things? <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> well, you, uh, you, you are teaching at Asbury, so we know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, in all, in all in, anyway, yeah, and, and you're sponsored by Talbot, so. Uh, but anyway, um, why is why does God allow Satan to begin with? Um, and I think a lot of this goes back to questions of people having a choice. Um, God, sometimes I've been like God. I wish we didn't have a choice. I wish we could just be robots, you know. So everything would be. But you know, God didn't design a world where. You know, every, well, a lot of the universe is just spheres and makes perfect sense in the laws of physics, but he also designed a universe that has diversity and he made some things to be able to operate um, with a little bit more intricacy. I mean, the information content in an E. coli bacterium, if I'm not mistaken, is something like uh, 10 to the 10,000 power, um, the whole universe a couple billion years ago just maybe had 10 to the 80th particles. You know, the information content wouldn't have been much more than that. Uh, or, you know, if you hold a younger Earth view, then was <laughs> 10 to the 80th particles was much more recently. But I mean, humans are the most complex thing in the universe. And God delighted to give us the, the opportunity to love him freely. And we chose to go a different way. And uh, Satan takes advantage of that, also going a different way. But in the midst of that testing, it's like Romans 9 talks about, you've got vessels of mercy and vessels of wrath. Um, God has an infinite universe. He doesn't, doesn't need to have um, all the universe sustain life. He can, he, you know, it's not wasteful for him to design a whole universe uh, because 
He has all power, he can do that. He has all time, he can do that. And he, he can let things play out through all of human history, but still have his ultimate purposes. Let these other things happen for the sake of those who will prove their love and their faithfulness. Um, faith again being faithfulness, that we're gonna trust God even when we go through hard times. We're gonna trust God even when everything is so easy that we might tend to forget about God. God is gonna have a remnant that's gonna be faithful to him. And Satan is there to stir things up. Interesting. Um, Problem of evil, I defer that to the philosophers and the theologians, but uh, that's my best uh, answer right now. So, so uh, here, here's a here's a, a Jewish uh, centric question here. Why 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 do you think why don't you think Jewish people recognize Yeshua by the apparent Jewish expectation that the Messiah will spread the knowledge of God to all the nations? What do they expect the Messiah to do when he comes? How will they recognize him? Any thoughts on that? <laughs> well, of course, Jewish thought today is very different than Jewish thought was 2,000 years ago. So uh -huh. <laughs> there's, there's, there's considerable continuity, there's considerable differences. So, I mean, 2,000 years ago, there were a whole range of Messianic expectations. And in terms of uh, God's unity, there actually were some different understandings uh, than before Maimonides as well, who kind of made it rigorously more uh, the unity of God, uh, Echad becomes Yaqid and, and so on. But also, uh, but Maimonides also would have said, uh, you're not Jewish if you don't believe in, in a Mashiach. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Mishnas and Hedron 10 1, you know, you, you, you're, you're, you're damned if you don't believe in the, in the resurrection of the dead. Well, today, a lot of Jewish people, I mean, you're still Jewish, whether you believe in the resurrection of the dead or not. And, uh, and there's different interpretations of Judaism from, you know, the conservative synagogue I attended, uh, the, the rabbi was a reconstructionist. And of course, he held different views than many of the conservative members of the congregation. And um, I, I won't go into all the details. He was, he was wonderful though, but um, there, there are different views that uh, sometimes have a wider view of, of what can be included in Judaism, sometimes have a narrower view from Reconstructionist on the one hand to Orthodox on the other. But as for uh, the expectations in the scriptures, yes, uh, the Messiah and God will bring about uh, the nations flowing into God's people. In Romans 11, Paul sees that as as, as this is going to bring the Jewish people to faith and recognizing that Yeshua is the Messiah, because look at all these Gentiles who are coming to the God of Israel because of Yeshua. But he also warns there for the Gentiles, you're, you're grafted in branches. Don't boast yourself against the Jewish branches. We've got a whole bloody history of Gentile anti-Semitism. And, and that's not not going to be forgotten overnight. It shouldn't be forgotten. And, and a lot of it was done in the name of the church and in the name of Jesus, totally contrary to the, the Jesus we read about in the, in the Bible, totally contrary to the spirit of Yeshua. I mean, even, even if you don't see the, the Jewishness of, of Yeshua, at least see that he was a man of peace. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and, you know, he talks about the, the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, the God of Israel with all your heart, love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, at least that. So the, the, the church has messed up for centuries. And, and I think it's, yeah, the church, I, I think Jewish people will be more, and, and some, some Jewish people do appreciate you know, the Gentile church were saying there's one God. <laughs> uh, but I think Jewish people as a whole will be much more, um, much more, 
well, there's already been a Jewish reappropriation of, of Jesus as Jewish, and there's now ongoing uh, reclamation of Paul as Jewish, but I think there'll be a much more widespread appreciation for what Jesus has meant in history as Gentile Christians increasingly recognize that our heritage is Jewish and that our faith is in the God of Israel. Wow, that is a great way to end our time. Uh, th thank you so much, Dr. Keener. Uh, that, was a, that, was, that was a perfect way to, to, to wrap it all up today. Um, and uh, we can't thank you enough for taking your time to be with us during this time. I know that if I, I speak for the, the thousands who have, who have checked in, you know, that saying thank you so much uh, uh, for being here. And we, I'd like to keep you here for the next three or four days you know, and pick your brain. You know? uh, but I, unfortunately, we can't. I've got all these, I've got a whole bunch of more questions I'd, I'd love to be able to ask, unfortunately. Um, but maybe, uh, maybe there's a way we can. I'll, I'll send. I'll tell you. I'll send them. We'll send them to you. And if you if you want to give us a, a quick answer to each of them, you know, uh, you know that that'd be great. You know, um, you know, just give it. Don't you know? Just just give a quick jot, and then we'll try to get them out to people. Um, but uh, but or, may, or maybe I can make a, a video and send it to you or something like that. Or, oh, oh, that'd be great. That'd be awesome. Yeah, whatever. Or we'll figure something out. Yeah. Oh, it's gonna take. A, yeah. Whatever. Good. <laughs> Well, good. Well, I, again, I can't thank you enough for being here, and and we're looking forward to to, to getting together personally when all this is over, yeah. and, uh, and and do it all over again. <laughs> yeah, when you don't give me your germs, man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we I'm a we scrub down, down the fine roots. You're gonna you're gonna be you're gonna be staying in the, in the in the Flashman suite. Uh, at, oh, uh, nice. Yeah, yeah. So uh, so so we we had you all set up. Oh, Anyways, uh, it's it's great to have you here. Um, I want to thank you. I want to thank the staff. We have uh, people behind the scenes uh, that have been working here. I want to thank uh, uh, the team leader, A. A. Vasquez, uh, uh, who is a, a charge of our digital media team, along with his team of Nicole Vaca, Grace Sui, uh, uh, Kieran Batista, and her brother Jan Batista. And uh, I want to say also thank you to Bobby Walter, my colleague uh, at uh, the Feinberg Center in, the, in Brooklyn. Uh, who has done the who's sifted through all the questions and sent the questions through uh, as well? I want to thank you, the audience, for being here. Thank you so much for uh, for attending. We, we wouldn't we wouldn't be here without you. So uh, thank you so much for being here and for your interest in in things biblical and and uh, things spiritual and and uh, things Jewish. And so we we thank you for being here for that as well. And and uh, if you have additional questions, please send them in to us. You know, well, we'll do our best. Uh, we'll. Maybe we can twist Dr. Dr. Keener's arm and uh, get him to answer a few more questions. So please do send those in to us as well. And, um, and, and please do connect with us. You can connect with us at our website, chosenpeople.com. Chosenpeople.com, you can connect with us. You can do all kinds of things. There's lots of fun, lots of fun things to do there. So uh, check it out, chosenpeople.com. Um, let me close in, in a word of prayer with the last two minutes we have left here. Uh, Heavenly Father, Lord, what a great two days this has been. Uh, so exciting, so interesting, so uh, so uh, uh, absorbing of our minds and our hearts, Lord. Father, thank you for the, that wonderful combination that Dr. Keener brings, Lord, of, uh, of, of mind and heart, Lord, Father, of, uh, of, 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 of word and spirit, Lord, Father. We thank you for that, and, and thank you for the way it's, it's blessed our hearts during this time. And I just think of the numerous times my heart has soared during, uh, during this time, and, and sometimes my heart is grieved during this time when I think of... Uh, human history, Lord. But, but I thank you, Lord, Father, for, uh, for the, the, uh, this time we've been able to share, Lord. I pray you'll bless Dr. Keener, Lord. I pray that you'll keep him healthy and strong, Lord, and give him years and years and years of, of faithful uh, ministry to you and, 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 and time with his, his, his lovely wife, Lord, and his children, Lord. And, and pray, Father, that he might enjoy these days in, uh, of, of his life, Lord, Father, and, and you might use him, continue to use him powerfully. Father, for your kingdom purposes, Lord. Thank you that we have a, we have a strong voice uh, on, on, uh, uh, for, the, for biblical authority, Father, and, and a man like Dr. Keener. Father, I pray, Lord, that uh, you will now uh, just dismiss us with your peace, Lord, and we might walk in your, in, in your ways, Lord, and do your will, Father, and, and seek you always with our entire hearts, Lord. For you said that when we seek you, we will find you if we seek you with all of our hearts. So we do that now. We commit our, our way to that, and we, and we uh, just bless your name now and forever. We pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen.
If you enjoyed what you just watched, please like, comment, or subscribe to our YouTube channel for more great teachings, videos on our work, and the latest updates on our ministry. If you'd like a copy of a free book I wrote entitled Isaiah 53 Explained, then please click on the link provided, and I know that you'll receive it and enjoy it. So God bless you, and shalom.